Hi everyone, it's James here from Pro Tools Expert. And Mike Ayton from Pro Tools Expert. And Marcus Huskins from Pro Tools Expert. Wow, and we three have come together to um, kind of promote stroke set up KMR's Dave Hill Summer Feel the Heat promotion. So what we're going to do uh, is we're going to look at three of the Dave Hill Stroke Crane Song plugins, the Phoenix 2, Peacock, and RA2, or if you're Egyptian, Ra2. Okay, James, so um, first of all, so tell us about KMR, exactly who are KMR? So um, if you're based in the UK, KMR are one of our higher end studio type resellers. Um, nice people, we like them a lot. Um, always have great stuff in stock. Um, it's one of those shops that I, I really shouldn't go in anymore because if I do, I really should leave my credit card behind uh, and I never do and I always come out with something expensive in the back of the car. But yeah, they are, they're a fabulous bunch of people, really cool shop. It's the sort of place where you want to go and you just chat and they provide you with coffee and you chat high-tech audio and even if you, d you don't actually buy anything, it's all about the customer experience and about the customer service. They're one of those resellers, and there are a few in the UK. We're very lucky from that respect, where you can go in, the guys really know their stuff, um, and you can just chat Pro Audio to your heart's content. And if you buy something, bonus. So we, we first met KMR, so we met Paul from KMR, he's their marketing manager, when um, we did our microphone uh, voiceover shootout, and... KMR lent us uh, all virtually all of the microphones and James and I were just dribbling quite frankly at some of the microphones we had and we're going to be also further working with KMR on uh, a my camp shootout which will be coming soon watch this space but yeah all good stuff so right Dave Hill who is he well, he's got some awesome shirts. He's got some awesome, <laughs> awesome shirts. Um, That's for sure. Yeah, for those of you who don't, yeah, for those of you who don't know, for instance, uh, Dave is famous for wearing some. Um, how could we say it? Rather eclectic, um, crazy Hawaiian t-shirts. Yes, but he's one of those guys who you wish he was your granddad because, quite frankly, I could chat to Dave for an eternity and still not have scratched the surface of his pro audio knowledge. This guy, um, I mean, to say he has, he, he's almost the kind of the, the godfather of retro tone and tonality and plugins and, and loveliness. Um, he was ori originally the guy behind the Avid Heat plugin. He's the daddy really of, of all this sort of, uh, Plug-in warmth. That, yeah, definitely. That, now, that people use. I, I think it's fair to say that none of the plugins we're reviewing today are are brutal. They're all very, very subtle. What they add to your audio is very gentle, or it certainly can be. And in my opinion, it probably should be used that way. Uh, and in the three videos you've got, let me also just explain. You're seeing still images of us during this video but what you'll actually get is when we cut to the main videos actually you've got screen capture video of um, the three of us doing our thing with those plugins so um, yeah I mean it's very very subtle what these plugins do when they're used at their best if you juice them up yes of course you can get um, retro kind of well certainly in the one I looked at the peacock uh, almost a point of distortion and kind of warmth beyond warmth but um it, they are very, very subtle and very gentle, but work in three very, very different ways. So, um, which one should we start with, boys? Well, we we, we thought we'd guess the, the advantage of, of three of us looking at this is we'll have very slightly different backgrounds and, and different ways of working and work in slightly different fields, although we do cross-pollinate. Um, and we thought it'd be interesting to approach the three different plugins from from three different sort of user perspectives. Marcus is going to take RA from, from the sampling perspective. Um, I'm looking at Phoenix 2 from a sort of post-production and voiceover angle. So James, you're going to as predominantly a, a, a tracking guy. You're going to be looking at at Peacock and how that works in 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 the context of music production. So should we kick off, James, maybe with with your 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 video? Let's Hope see you how you got on. Here we go. 
So my part of this Dave Hill Crane Song plug-in event thing is going to be about this baby. This is the Peacock Vinyl Emulation. Now, it has to be said at this point that I am using the AAX DSP version, not the native version, but both are available and they both sound just as good. That's the whole benefit of using AAX. But I'm using it, the DSP version, because I have an HDX card. So, that out of the way, let's have a quick chat about this bad boy, the Peacock. So, Peacock is kind of vinyl emulation, not down to as much as psk, psk, psk. There are plenty of plugins that do that whole kind of vinyl retro sound thing. What the Peacock is doing is actually reproducing the distortion and the harmonics and the colour that come out of a vinyl reproduced audio file. So, what have we got? There are three main controls to the Peacock. We've got the harmonic, the dynamic control, output trim is kind of exactly that, dither on and off, but we've got the most important one over here, this is the colour. To get into the nitty gritty of what this is actually doing, the harmonic and the dynamic controls kind of interact together to control the amount of coloration and harmonic distortion. The colour setting is, if you like, the tone of that vinyl emulation and of that colour. So gold setting is effectively the best, the gold standard. Silver is supposed to be the cleanest and most transparent and they get more and more juicy and more and more beefy and more and more saturated, stroke distorted as you increase the setting. So through gold, rich, fat into deep. So what I've got are three audio examples of how I've used and how I think you could use the Peacock Vinyl Emulation plugin. And the first one is on a basic bass guitar audio file. So let me just play that back for you. I'll bypass it first. I'll bring the harmonic distortion down and the dynamic down. And then I'll juice it in slowly. This is in gold mode, the kind of de facto standard mode. So you can hear at that sort of level, at gold, in the gold setting, we get starting to get a bit of warmth, a bit of richness, a little bit of harmonic overtones. We could almost call it distortion, but it's not quite distortion. Let me knock it back to silver. Now, to say it's subtle at gold and silver levels, I think is an understatement. It's a very, very gentle effect, but it is about coloration. It's about adding character to the sound. Um, even as I'm saying this, I'm kind of gesticulating with my hands something chronic because it's a very kind of organic thing that it's adding to this bass part. With these very high harmonic and dynamic settings, if I now go through silver, gold, rich, fat, and deep, you'll really hear it start to kick in. Silver mode. There's rich, you can really hear it's pushing now. See, I really like fat and deep mode, but used with a lot less harmonic and a lot less dynamic setting.
So that's it used on a bass guitar, a naked bass guitar. Now there's one more setting in here, the dither control, which Dave suggests you only use if you're using it on a stereo master channel or on a bus channel because you're then dithering down to 16-bit. But at the moment, I'm not because it's used on a single instrument channel. So let's try it actually on a stereo mix. So this is a track I worked on with Rex Strother, and it's a kind of jazz ballad, piano, brushes, bass, really nice, gentle kind of song. The vocals are quite up front, so I just want to warm it up a little bit. I'm going to use Peacock just for that, just to give me some kind of vinyl loveliness, some vinyl ooze, if you like. So let's have a listen to that. Bypass to start with. That we knew disappeared after all It left like the leaves leave the trees in the fall And I ask myself, does it matter at all? No, no, no Was fun. See, I think for that, using any of the higher settings, fat or deep, is just too much. I think rich or rich is probably as far as you can go. Let's jump in a little bit further. No, no, no. push too hard you start to get kind of a little bit of break up a little bit, a little bit of distortion which you don't necessarily want that I, all I want to do is give the track the effect of that kind of vinyl loveliness vinyl playback and um, I don't want to get too far down, down the saturation or distortion route I mean obviously whenever you're adding har harmonics you are effectively adding a kind of distortion but I think that's just really nice set between gold and rich um, it's just nice it's adding a little bit of warmth, a few extra overtones, a few extra harmonics, just filling in the gaps in the digital almost. So the last example I've got is on a full drum mix. And you can see here, here's my settings. Let me just solo out the drums. And again, you could go for the very gentle, just warming it up slightly. But I think for this particular track, there's an awful lot of reverb and it's got kind of a very big drum sound. So I think warming up that reverb with a bit of vinyl is going to sound really, really nice. And you'll hear exactly what I mean. I'll bypass it first, then I'll kick in the fat setting so you really hear it go for it. It's on my drum bus and I've also got an SSL compressor and Avid limiter on there but let's just hear the difference this setting makes. Bypass now. having a really good effect on the kind of that big 80s kind of snare drum sound and it's warming up the kick drum just nicely. Um, I'll let the track run through. Got to be careful with this though because on the hi-hats too much harmonic distortion and too much of the, the dynamic setting can really cause problems with a kind of a distorted sizzle. Let me try and find the hi-hats quickly. I think that's in about here somewhere. I push these too far. Not nice when you push them too far for the hi hats.
I think that sounds absolutely awesome uh, on a drum master bus. It's really doing a nice job. Those toms now sound much broader almost, much fatter. You know, it's not a terribly thirsty plugin. Uh, it's also not a terribly expensive plugin, which is quite nice. But I don't know of anyone else who knows their digital audio onions quite as much as Dave Hill does. Um, he's a lovely chap. He's a great bloke to talk to. He's always at the trade shows uh, in the UK and the US and around the world. He's just one of those guys you can chat to for hours. But be careful because the guy is super, super smart and you can be left behind very, very quickly. Thank, thank you, James. That was really um, cool to sit on, on three different sources. Um, for my money, I kind of really did like the fat and deep on the bass. The, the sort of edge it added, I thought, stopped it sounding kind of too uh, L.A. studio session-y and made it a little more gritty, a little more real and kind of added just, for me, more life to it. It stopped um, it sounding quite so D.I., I think. Yes, it, 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 yes, it's, it's almost as if you had a, cab, a slight cabinet distortion mm. there or a cone thing sort of going on. And, yeah, it just stops it being too clean and too pure. But um, interestingly enough, on the, on the full mix of the, the uh, lovely jazz song you did with Rex, for my, I, I thought that was so subtle what was going on there until you overwound it. When, when it went, oh, not liking it, it did less on the busier mix for me. Mm. But because they're, they're actually not that many transients in that song. It's quite gentle. It's, you know, it's it's not one for dynamics, that particular song. Whereas with the drum uh, mix, suddenly when you had, it, you had the compressor going, I was like, I'm mm, not quite sure if I, I like that compressor setting on the drums. And then suddenly when you, when you added Peacock in as well, suddenly it gelled. And for me, I was going, oh, yes, now I so get that. It sounds so right to me. And I really, really liked it on, on the drums. So f for me, it seems to work, the vinyl one seems to really, really kind of work best on the more transienty material and, and less ha, ha, does less on the sort of smooth, less dynamic stuff. That Which would kind of make sense, really, wouldn't it? Because cause the, the harder you hit vinyl back in the old days, the more effect you got. Yes, I think so. Uh, but that, I, I thought it was quite noticeable on on the the busier, denser stuff. It was it was less effective until it was wrong, so to mm, speak. Yeah, and more noticeable on 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 the sort of clearer, purer sort of stuff for my money. I'm much more of a fan of the sort of gold and rich settings rather than the fat and deep setting. But again, there's a, there's a place for all of them. I mean, it's, a, it's a very simple plugin to set up, I think. It, Dave would probably say it's a very simple plugin to use wrong. But um, yeah, it's definitely adding something. I'm, I'm not sure I could put my hand on it and put my finger on it and say every single time I want to use it. But in the right environment for the right track, it works really, really well. I agree. And uh, I was with you too, that I felt deep sometimes with where when that was in at the deep settings, I was starting to go, oh, you need a high pass filter in here and there. And things are starting. For me, it sounded like a mix that was a little bit more out of control for my money. Mm. OK, guys, here's uh, my my uh, take on things. And I'm doing Phoenix 2. Here you go. Hi, this is Mike Ayton and... I'm here to look at the uh, Phoenix 2. Now, uh, this was um, designed by Dave Hill under the uh, Crane Song banner uh, for them. It's native and DSP, and it runs on Pro Tools 10 and 11 AAX format. It's great that it's DSP. Um, I'm an HDX user, so... Uh, anything that runs on DSP gets a huge thumbs up in this camp. Um, now, um, Phoenix 2 is runs on floating point maths, and uh, what that means I'm never quite sure. I leave that up to the intellectuals of the world who are clever at coding, but I'm assured it's a very great thing. Um, it also has a much lower noise floor than the original plug-in, which, um, for those of you who are in the original, probably worth upgrading just for that alone. Now... Uh, Dave um, has taken his kind of uh, all the craft that he used when he was the electronics designer for the uh, ATR services ARIA discrete tape recorders and he, he's put all this electronic um, and magnetic cleverness 
and 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 put it into this Phoenix plugin. And what does that mean? I hear you ask. It's well, really, it's a non-linear saturation um, that's created by magnetic tape, and it, it has all those characteristics as as well as the the characteristics of the record and replay electronics. Um, so um, it also has the equalization curve of of the tape electronics or the replay. So if we take a look at the plugin, there are five different tape uh, stroke analog electronic effect types over here. And there are three different sorts of brightness. Uh, we have here the, the gold, which is essentially flat. We have sapphire, which is brighter. And we have opal, which uh, over on the left hand side here, which is the warmest setting. Um, now, on the plugin, we have an input trim and we also have an output trim. Now, when the plugin uh, is in bypass, it's in bypass, but when the trims are in zero mode, so input and output trims are both in zero and the process is at zero, what that effectively means is the plugin is identical to being in bypass and what comes in literally goes out. Nothing is uh, altered and it's essentially bit transparent. So nothing happens until we start adjusting how much of the saturation and analog electronics we want to add into the signal. Now the point of having an input trim uh, and an output trim is that the um, the way this plugin works is that as as things tend towards digital zero, it tends to have more and more of an effect. Um, so, for if you've got slightly lower level signals, you're able to boost them with the input trim, and if you've got very hot signals that were, would be in danger of clipping, you can pull them down with the input trim. But then on the output trim on the other side, you can put your your signal back up to or pull it down from where it should be. Okay, so that's a quick sort of run through of the layout. It's a very simple graphical layout. Um, it's what more can I say? You know, it's it's a few knobs. Let's cut to the chase and um, see how it sounds. Okay, there are five different flavours here of of tape and analog electronics um, that you can choose from. What we have is the first one is called luminescence, which is the most neutral of the five settings. The next one is iridescent, which has uh, apparently a fatter bottom end and mid range than luminescence. Radiance uh, has a more aggressive form of compression on the tape side of it. And Dark Essence has uh, even more aggressive and it can actually really, really help by reducing sibilance by what it can do is, is increasing the loudness of all other frequencies apart from sort of the sibilance areas. So giving the effective um, oral... Um, result of, of sound making things sound less less sibilant and uh, the last one is luster which is a kind of um, a variable curve which is it's it's the most gentle of, of all of them when it's on uh, on its lowest process setting but if you crank it up it um, it has uh, almost as much as dark essence on the on the uh, Dave Hill source side. So let's have a little listen and see. Now, I'm predominantly a post-production mixer, so um, most of what I do involves dialogue. So I've got a voiceover here recorded by uh, myself here, and it's of Jane Copeland doing a corporate voiceover. And we'll just play it uh, a few seconds of it naturally. A business case contains a few important components. It will be driven by the overall objectives, strategies, and planned activities. Okay, there we have it. So, let's now add in some of the effect. Now, if we go to we'll go to the uh, luminescence, the which is the uh, most neutral of the five, and if we leave it on gold, which is also the 
the most kind of um, neutral in terms of, of, of the brightness. And I'll just start adding in the process and let you hear it as I, as I crank it in. A business case contains a few important components. It will be driven by the overall objectives, strategies and planned activities. These will drive numerous assumptions, which will in turn drive the profit and loss and the key financial metrics. OK, so as you could hear, it fattens up the bottom end there. Now, if, if I move across to Opal, you should hear a darkening and a warming of, of the overall characteristic of the sound. A business case contains a few important components. It will be driven by the overall objectives, strategies and planned activities. Back to These gold. will drive numerous assumptions, which will in turn drive the profit and loss and the key financial metrics. And over to Sapphire, Finally, where we get some, some of the brighter harmonics coming through. With clear mitigation and contingency plans. OK, so if we leave it on the... Uh, I not sure. I think I prefer. I would vary between gold and the sapphire. I think I'd probably stick with gold. Let's now go between the uh, characteristics and we'll go for from luminescent into iridescent and hear the difference. So what we should hear is a richening of the bottom end and the mid range compared to how it is now. Here we go. A business case contains a few important components. It will be driven by the overall objectives, strategies and planned activities. Yeah, you can definitely hear the low mid-range there. Assumptions, ...which will in turn drive the profit and loss and the key financial metrics. And here into Radiant. Finally, there needs to be a detailed risk and sensitivity analysis with clear mitigation and... Oh, that's very clear plans. now, very marked. A business case contains a few important components. And dark essence, it will be driven by the overall which is the variable one. Strategies and planned activities. So down here it's quite These light. These will drive numerous assumptions, which will in turn drive the drive profit it. and loss and the key financial metrics. Finally, there needs to be a detailed risk and sensitivity analysis. And I'll go back through them again. mitigation and contingency plans. There's luster. A business case contains a few important components. It will be driven by the overall objectives, strategies and planned activities. These will drive numerous assumptions, which will in turn drive the profit and loss and the key financial metrics. It really darkens Finally, down that top end and warms it up. Detailed risk and sensitivity analysis. Let's go back to gold. With clear mitigation and contingency plans. Iridescence. A business case contains a few important components. It will be driven by the overall objectives, and strategies again. and planned activities. These will drive numerous assumptions. Suddenly when we go back to the original, turn drive the profit and sounds loss, kind of and the key financial metrics. unremarkable without. It's one of those Finally, quite subtle effects um, risk and that you put it in and, and contingency plans. you think, yep, yeah, that's nice, I'm a liking it. And, and it's, it's subtle, components. but very nice. But when you take it away, you suddenly... Objectives, ooh. And planned activities. It's like someone's made the world very boring all of a sudden when we go into bypass. OK, now, for those of you who are music lovers um, and not post-production people, uh, here's some, some music I recorded today. Now, um, I have to add that because I'm a post-production mixer and not a music mixer, um, I'm not a fantastic musician. Now... Uh, to be able to play copyright-free music, uh, I've had to record something. So uh, I recorded some of my guitar practising this morning. So I'm just kind of vamping around over a, a G7 chord. And please, musicians of the world, um, apologies for my poor guitar playing. And uh, I'm learning. I'm trying to study at the moment. So uh, please be forgiving of my playing. OK, without further ado, here we go. It's a bit too much. Okay. Let's darken it down. And if we want those highs. OK, 
Okay. And let's now try iridescence. which has got a lot more tape compression. if you ever cook it. And finally Dark Essence, the variable one. Okay, so there we have it. That shows you uh, a little few examples of Phoenix 2 and how the um, tape saturation and analog electronics that Dave Hill has previously built can be put into the sound of your sources. Um, I particularly like this plugin. I, I really do think it add it it adds something. Like with a lot of things, it's capable of being overcooked, uh, and I think subtlety is the name of the game here. But there are times when it really, really does add something and, and a, a really nice colour to the sound of, of what you're doing. And there's a lot of variation um, you can achieve with this plugin. And you subtly, I think it's a, a really, really great tool and uh, a nice plugin. Thank you. So, Marcus, what did, what did you think, um, having, having seen that? Well, first off, I think it's a fantastic voiceover artist. Yeah, she has a, has a lot of talent and a lot of experience. I use it for a, a, a lot of things. It's 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 incredible with these type of plugins. Uh, I would classify them under what I like to call fairy dust plugins. Um, sometimes it's just a little sprinkle is all you need, and it was just really interesting to hear you passing through the uh, through the different. I guess it'd be algorithms, the different uh, radiance, luminance, dark essence. Yep. Sometimes it's just enough that you need to get a little bit more apparent loudness out of a voiceover and just get it to just get it to pop out a little bit more or you know just change the overall vibe of the of the bottom end. Yeah, it's kind of like contrast, isn't it, with photography where if you just slightly increase the contrast, suddenly you get this difference between blacks and whites and things just pop more. Yeah, and it, it's interesting there was one particular setting that you were using there. I'm, I'm guessing you went through your 414 for that, right? I did, which so, is which is not a bright microphone. It's actually got quite a um, possibly you know slight dip compared to a lot of cardioid condenser microphones. It's it's not known as a bright microphone. Yeah, so you know, like based on the voice that you're recording, you can kind of get a little bit more sizzle out of it, or you know, round off the bottom end, or give it a little bit more, and you know, yeah, I think these are kind of like a a, a tone enhancement type plugin that you know, if if you need the voiceover to have a little bit more, or it could be vocal in whatever case, that you can just kind of dial things in to get it to sit right where you need it to in the mix. Mm. Because I, I have my, my preamp of choice is the Focusrite ISA1, and I'm continually on that. You have the ability to be able to adjust the um, input impedance of, of the preamp. So you're able effectively to sort of color the microphone. And when I have a voice that lacks weight sometimes, you, if, if you um, increase the impin, input impedance, it allows uh, a lot more weight. And, and sh it's like a, um, a tone shift, a little bit like the, the Oasis Air plugin, where you are able to push the bottom end, slightly reduce the top and add more warmth. Other voices don't need it and you're doing the contrast and, and really reducing the input impedance and, and slightly brightening up the top end. But for me, so that's what I try and get it better on the way in. And then and then adding Phoenix 2 allows a whole nother dimension of, of tilt at the other end as well. Exactly, seemed, yeah. 
And Once same, all the other elements come into the mix and yeah. you can kind of take a step back, look at the big picture and say, all right, well, that, that was sitting pretty good when we were tracking, but right now I'm feeling like that's, you know, either a little bit dull or it might be a little bit bright. So let's, let's get this to, you know, just from yeah, tone wise, it, let's get this to sit in the mix a little bit better. It does. And I, I find I'm using it practically on every voiceover now. It really has become totally one of my go to plugins now because um, you've got that that ability to add some form of, of tape compression. So you're getting a little bit of softening of the dynamics, which can sometimes help in the context of a mix. Just to, I mean, I'm always controlling my voiceovers anyway, but obviously sometimes within the context of a mix, it, it, it allows it just to sit in a slightly tighter dynamic band, yes. allowing you to tuck the M&E up underneath, but without it sounding over compressed because... Um, it's a kind of, uh, with compressors, obviously, it's not frequency dependent what's happening with the attack. And what is happening, I think, in this is different frequencies seem to be having different attack times, depending on which which of the Dave Hill sources you're in sort of thing. So it, it's, it's a subtle effect and it, it stops your voiceovers. You don't have to use compression to make them sit. Yeah, It's another but form of compression, but it seems to be frequency sensitive. But there's one thing that became pretty evident to me when I was when I was watching this is is definitely you know less is more. It's probably one of those things that you dial in and go, oh yeah, okay, I love that. Now let me dial it back a bit because it's easy to kind of get carried away because it just just keeps sounding better and a little bit louder, and you just keep pushing it. But pause, and I think it's it's of, of the three plugins. Uh, we'll come to RA two in a second, but it's probably the most overt of the three. I would say. Yeah. I love but, it in music too. Uh, yeah, I I, I I loved it on the guitar guitar track that you uh, showed there, and and you can definitely hear it when you're when you're you know trying it out on different sources, uh, vocals, any bass or anything like that. It, it it becomes really evident when you start going through those different settings and and pushing things. So you know, I'd probably be using this in the music context as a as a you know a tone shaping tool on a track on a source track basis, and kind of getting everything to sit together and if, if the bass doesn't have quite as much heft as I wanted it to or I need the vocal to sound a little darker or brighter or something. And then, you know, on the two bus, sure. But definitely one of those plugins that you just sprinkle across where you need it. Love that plugin. James, what did you think it did vis-a-vis -vis the, the guitar bit? Well, I, I love the fact that we all call our kind of, I, I call them glory plug plugins or um, pl self-gratification plugins because you don't, really need to add them but they add that little bit of something that little bit of secret sauce yeah um, yes it's like salt and pepper that it enhances what's there isn't it yeah that you you you, you would is bland without yeah you you'd miss it if it wasn't there but if you listen to it long enough you'd go now what was that plugin doing again yeah, so, I'm with you. That yeah. I, I, the second I take things off, I go, oh, the world's gone quite flat and mm. quiet. No, I so say on the guitar, I really, really liked it because it. I mean, it's a very similar. And I, oh, I'm going to stab in the dark here. The original Phoenix plugin and the um, Heat plugin are very, very similar. Now, not being able to say for certain what's gone on in Phoenix too, but I suspect Dave has taken things to the next level and gone. What one more degree further into it? Um, but you certainly I, I, reduced the noise level in it. Yeah, I, mean, I I really like it though. I, I think it's I use heat on every mix. I, I'm to the point where I actually mix with heat in. It's not something okay. like, it's something I I add later on. Um, I quite liked it. Uh, take heat heat out and put um, Phoenix Two in. There is a very subtle difference. I, I mean, I don't I don't know how the noise floor compares between Phoenix Two and Heat. But certainly, it it adds a very similar flavour. As you say, what? Yeah, a, 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 the little something. Um, but I like it. I like it very much. Okay, Marcus. I think uh, let's see how you got on with your uh, RA two. Hi, Marcus here from Pro Tools Expert, and today we're going to be having a look at using the Dave Hill RA two plugin uh, when working with samples. So I've got some clips here, and these are basically one velocity layer of a sample library I created. So this is a Celtic harp here. This is a C3 pitch. So just different round robins or variations of that particular note. So let's have a look at how we can use this plugin to give a little bit more vibe or character to these samples. So the first thing I wanna have a look at here is a low level. And it's kind of hard to explain what some of these parameters do, 
So I think I'll just let this play in loop mode. And then what we'll do is we'll just use our ears and we'll just listen to what's happening here. So we're just getting a lot more detail that's coming in. It's not really affecting the high end, it's just bringing some detail up in the lows. Now the next thing I want to look at here is the peak control. And the peak control operates as kind of like a soft clip. So let's just engage this here. We'll really hear it on the front end, so we'll just move this all the way up to the top. That's a little bit too much. And then we have a hardness here. Now, these particular samples are, are pretty low, um, but if I have it all the way down to the bottom on the hardness here, it's gonna cap it at a minus three. And if you move it all the way up to the top, we're gonna be capping it at minus 10. Then we got a trim control here from minus six to plus six. So we can trim back our output of the plugin here. So if we're doing anything that's adding some gain and we wanted to uh, match that, we could bring it back down again. Uh, next, we'll hop over to the front end here. So we've got a drive here. This works just as we'd expect, just drive. So let's listen to the cumulative effect of everything we have going now. pull that back a bit. Now let's move over to the even harmonics. So the even harmonics are the second harmonic distortion, which is the octave. Uh, should mention that the low level operates on the third harmonic distortion here. So that's why we have such an audible difference with the low level, but the even harmonics is working with the second harmonic. So let's start making some adjustments to this here. So as a cumulative effect, this is our sample raw. And then by adding RA2, so we can definitely give it a lot more character. Now, if I was using this type of plugin to sweeten any samples, what I would most likely do is I would just print this or render this to the audio, and then I would edit the samples that have the RA plugin rendered into them. So that's RA2 from Dave Hill Designs, and I hope you guys got something from this, and we'll talk to you later. Cheers. So first of all, I'd like to say I think this is probably the most subtle of the three plugins. I think the, the only control yeah. that I could definitely say yeah, that's doing something was the low level control because um, it's bringing yeah, out a lot it, of the bottom end detail. It, ex exactly, uh, it, it's it's one of those things that you know you really got to pay attention and, and listen carefully to what's happening. But I mean, you know, with samples, a lot of the times, you know, you, it's similar to what Mike said, and it's similar to any good practice. Is you want to try to get the absolute, you know, best signal that you can on the way in. And then sometimes what I'll do is if, if it's just, if it's missing a little something, I'll often use one of these fairy dust plugins, like I call. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just one of those things that you, you know, you kind of dial in something because it's also going to be a cumulative effect because even though we're listening to those samples in isolation, you have to think that the end result is they're going to be mapped out to a keyboard and you might have, you know, five round robins and, and five different velocity layers or more. And they're all going to be happening on top of each other. So even just adding a little bit of something just globally across all the samples, it's it's going to make the difference when you start playing the instrument mm, itself. Definitely. But I think I'm right in saying the low level um, control is the third harmonics. Absolutely. And the and even that's, can, that's the yeah. equivalent yeah. of pushing the amplifier gain. Whereas yeah. with, with an amplifier, when you push the gain, obviously all the low level signals come up, but then your upper level signals end up in dis massive distortion. But what Dave's been able to do is recreate what happens to the lower level signals, but still letting the upper level signals be linear. 
So that's the real kind of genius behind what's happening with that, that you can you can push up and get all that decay and that detail in oh, in, yeah. in the samples. Yeah. Uh, for me, that was the the most noticeable thing with that. And you kind of know, I think, with with someone of Dave's calibre and pedigree that, you know, he's thought about all the sort of the, ma- the, the clever mathematics and the engineering behind it because he's written a lot of stuff about dither and, and all this sort of thing that, you know, goes beyond mere mortals like me. And uh, you know that if, if, you're, if you're using samples that are in process with his plugins, they're not going to be creating massive problems when, when they're pitched down or whatever they're... Because, because of his plugins, you know, any problem you'll get is just because of it's inherent within a sample that's pitched down or up too far. You know, it's. I put uh, I put people like Dave Hill in a in a similar, and again, I'm not going to categorise anyone, but I put them in the same group of incredibly intelligent people in this industry. People like Michael Carnes from Exponential Audio, the yes. sort of guys that I could sit down and and go for, go for a beer with, but in five minutes be lost. But, but in a lovely, floaty, bubbly yeah, way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, if I understood an ounce of what you're talking about, <laughs> <laughs> I would be a clever man, Gungadin. Yes. But um, it's certainly true. I mean, all three plugins that we've looked at are, are very subtle, um, do very different things. I, I think there's no two ways about it. I mean, they, they really have, they've got in Peacock the whole vinyl emulation in. Uh, in Phoenix, Phoenix 2, too, the, the, it's, it's, it's very tapey, tape. you know, it is yeah. tape. Um, and to be able to add those extra harmonics in RA2, even or odd, as, or even or third, as it were, they are definitely in that category, glory, fairy dust, call them what you will, plugins, but very, very usable. They sound really, really good. Any uh, any personal favourites here, guys? Uh, for me, my standout favourite for me, head and shoulders, was Phoenix 2. I have to say, uh, and, and that's here. not and that's not me being biased because I tested it. <laughs> no, same same here. No, absolutely. Uh, that, for me, that, it did it the most. Too. I use it on all my voiceovers now, and I'm experimenting with it on uh, in post production with using it on dialogues actually because because it's DSP and because I have an HDX card, I've got more DSP than I can shake a stick at. Um, you know, to to enable some form of tightening and constraint and harmonic beauty. With with dialogues, but without actually contr- restraining its dynamics by yeah. compression and attack yeah. time, um, it's it kind of does what to me the the Sonox warmth control does in its dynamics. It's just like source, and then I can add Dave Hill source, and it's like, Absolutely. oh yes, that's yeah. like the cream on top of the really good fruit. James, and, yourself? See, for me, it was Peacock purely because I spend so much time in Drumland. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I've got my I've got my drum chain pretty wh- pretty much set up. I'll try new stuff. I'll throw new goodies in and things like that. But Peacock did something to my drum bus. It, it just, mm, it blah, 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 you know, secret sauce it's the, again. It's the harmonics, it isn't it? Did something. Yeah. Um, and for me, because I spend so much time doing drums, uh, Kel Surprise, I'm a drummer. Yeah, it, it's it's Peacock for me. It just did something that I wasn't expecting, and it did something that I really liked. So I mean, th- there we have it. We have kind of you know. Uh, RA2 is 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 something that's quite I think subtle but uh, for post production probably less of a use Phoenix 2 I think for post production it's got massive potential and it, you know it's something I'm really looking at I'm going to go and go and have a play with Peacock now and actually uh, and have a little mess around on my own and and say right okay let's let's try it up against Phoenix then it's very interesting well, guys out there in um, podcast land, hope you enjoyed that. Um, we're probably going to try and do a few more of these, these kind of hybrid video podcast extra type things. I'm not going to sure what we're going to call them yet, but um, it's for now, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. And from me.